Um, first of all, thank you so much for including me in this program. Um, and a Professor Bai mentioned this in the morning that one of the goals of the program is to nurture young scholars. And I guess I'm one of those young scholars here. Um, also, this paper itself is in a very early stage of development. So I will be very much looking forward to your comments and suggestions. Um, another thing is uh, I wanna apologize first that I am still in a quarantine hotel and the connection may not be very stable. So if you notice any problems, um, please feel free to let me know. I can always turn off my video and hopefully we can get a better connection that way. Okay, great. Um, so, well, uh, we just uh, heard about government responses to vaccine programs and now we're switching gear to uh, determinants of state capacity from a historical perspective. So in this paper, uh, I wanna look at the impact of war and public goods on development of state capacity using evidence from historical China. So a bit on the motivation side, um, we know that there's a large literature in development as well as cross-country case studies that argues for an important role that state capacity played in promoting economic development. So given its importance, it's of course imperative that we understand the origin of state capacity itself. So outside the field of economics, there actually has been a large literature on state building. Uh, for example, one of the early, the first generation of theories, such as those neo Marxist traditions, they tend to view the state as an arena where different social groups come and compete for political dominance. And then starting in the 1950s, we have the second generation of theories. Um, for example, Whit uh, Fogo, the historian, most famously proposed the hydraulic civilization theory where he argued that economies uh, who depend more on large scale waterworks, such as irrigation systems, tend to develop strong centralized and absolute states. And of course, when he's making this claim, he's thinking about Oriental civilizations, such as ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, and of course, China. And then Tilly in 1990, motivated by the experience of Europe, argued that war, uh, that uh, the origin of state lies in war and the preparation for war. So those two theories being the most um, prominent example of the second generation, uh, even though they're pointing at different factors and even though they're motivated by uh, experience of different regions, they actually share a uh, deep connection. That is, um, whether it's hydraulic management project or national defense, they're, they're both a form of public goods. And this is the point when state capacity enters the field of economics. Uh, and here we have Vesely in, uh, in person most famously formalized these connection between public goods and state capacity using game theory models. So here in their theoretical setting, uh, we have a state which is a single decision maker and he is facing, uh, he's facing uncertain exogenous shocks and trying to optimally allocate investment to state capacity across time so as to maximize the expected utility. So as, as you can probably see from the previous examples that um, a prominent feature of the second generation of theories is that they tend to take a top-down perspective on state building. And the on the empirical side, uh, consistent with this top-down theoretical perspective, we also have most of existing studies focus on macro-level country characteristics, such as political regimes and stabilities. So in this paper, on the other hand, um, I try to join a recent effort that employs within country variations. And um, by utilizing this approach, we'll be able to control for macro level country characteristics. And also we'll be able to zoom in on the demand side factors from a locality's perspective. So this will take more of a bottom up approach, which complements the top down perspective of the traditional literature. 
And this approach will also allow for an empirical investigation into state society relations, uh, a point that I'll come back later in, in the later part of this presentation. So um, let me first give you a very brief preview of the results. So in this paper, I employ a data set on historical Chinese states from 221 BC to the end of the imperial period in 1912. And then for identification, uh, I'll utilize changes in foreign war front lines, as well as changes in the Yellow River courses as the source of exogenous shocks to local demand of public goods. And then for the, uh, for the results part, I have three main results. Uh, first, I find, that, I find that both forms of public goods, whether it's national defense or hydraulic management, they all have a positive and significant impact on the expansion of central state capacity into the localities. And among those two factors, foreign war turned out to be the most important factor. And then as an extension of the main result, I'll also investigate uh, a potential interaction between state and local institutions. And the finding there is that the impact of foreign wars tend to be smaller in localities with stronger local institutions, such as ethnic minority groups or lineages and religious organizations. Um, so before I dive into the data part, uh, let me just show you a very simple theoretical framework. So here I consider a bargaining game between a state and a locality. Uh, the locality pays a tax in exchange for a state service. And the service, uh, the goal of the service is to decrease the probability of a disaster. And then in the absence of a state, the locality will rely on the local institutions to cope with the disaster. And this is a very simple, uh, straightforward bargaining game. And in the equilibrium, uh, the state service will increase with the value of the public goods. Okay, so the model is very simple. Uh, the paper is empirical, uh, but the reason that I wanna show you this theoretical framework is because it actually highlights um, some of the features of my empirical setting it also highlights you know, a few divergences that I take from other models in the literature. So most notably here, uh, I made three assumptions. Uh, number one, I assume that the expansion of the state capacity is determined by a state locality dynamics. So in other words, it's not the state uh, as a single decision maker here, uh, but instead I have two players uh, trying to bargain. And this highlights the bottom up approach that I mentioned earlier. And the second assumption is that a capable central state already exists. And because of this assumption, my empirical finding will speak more to the literature on the intensification of state capacity rather than the origin of state. And the thirdly, I also assume a neutral state. Uh, in other words, the state in my setting cares about tax revenue, but not the source of the tax revenue. So in other words, there'll be no domestic interest to groups. So the choice for each one of these um, three assumptions, they're, they're motivated uh, mostly empirically because of you know, the features of my empirical setting is in history, China. Um, and they also highlights a few differences that I my empirical setting have away from other models in the literature. Is there any questions here? Great. So um, this is a paper in economic history, and you know, uh, as a norm, I will have to spend some time explaining the the coding of the data. So um, my, my uh, data sample covers the Imperial China period from 200 BC to uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And then I have two variables of interest. Uh, on the dependent variable side, I'm interested in state capacity. And on the independent variable side, I'm interested about local demands for public goods. So uh, as many of you probably already know that um, you know, for the literature of state de development, it is one of the central difficulty in the literature as how to measure state capacity. 
So this, this endeavor is complicated, uh, not only because of you know, data availability issues, but also because the function of state can be multidimensional. The state does you know, many things. The state implements policies, provides public goods, and also extract resources from localities. So two things here. Number one, um, because I'm looking at state capacity more, of as, more as a social contract, so I'll try to measure both the administrative aspect and the fiscal aspect of state capacity. And then number two, um, because I'm mostly interested in state locality dynamics, uh, I, the variables here will be designed in a way to best approximate the capacity of central state. Okay. <clears throat> so for the wide, for the dependent variables, uh, I have three measures of central state capacity. The first one is based on administrative centers. So um, we, we all know that one of the cornerstone system of historical China is a county prefecture system. So the county prefecture system was first established in 221 BC at the beginning of the Qing dynasty. And before that, China had a system, uh, had a feudal system, which is uh, quite similar to that of Europe where the king divided his land into smaller kingdoms and each one of those smaller kingdoms are ruled by local lords. So the key difference here between the county prefecture system and a feudal system uh, is that at least uh, theoretically um, and to, uh, you know, to some extent, the county prefecture system is, is designed to be centralized, to be a hierarchical. So the, the, govern the governance of the localities are closely monitored and to some extent also managed by the central government under a county prefecture system. So in this paper, uh, my main variable of state capacity will be based on um, the density of county and prefectural seats. And of course, uh, in, you know, during many dynasties, we also have non-typical administrative units established so as to meet specific specific need of the time. So for example, we have autonomous ethnic regions, we have military bases that are governed by the generals, and we have fiefs that are given to members of the royal family. So for the main results, I'm gonna exclude those non-typical administrative units because, um, because um, you know, the goal here is, is to measure capacity of central state, and it is hard to, to you know, uh, argue that non-typical administrative units also represents the central state in this setting. Okay. And the second variable I use is uh, major road networks. And in historical China, uh, the road networks can fall under several dif uh, different categories. Uh, most notably, we can have national level major road networks that are typically initiated by the central state uh, and are usually closely monitored by the central state in this case. Uh, and at the same time, we might have local roads that are managed by the localities and even entirely managed by the communities. So in this case, uh, I'm gonna focus only on the natural, uh, national level major roads because they give me a better um, measurement of central state capacity. And then the last one is uh, taxation. So you know, uh, tax, tax, uh, taxation data with detailed geographical information is very rare for historical states. Uh, and here, I uh, fortunately, I was a only able to get taxation data from three periods. Um, well, this, this um, data set has many limitations. Most importantly, um, here the taxation data is not about total tax revenue. Uh, instead, it includes only one kind of taxation from each period. So here I have three data points on agricultural tax and two data points on commercial tax. So uh, I acknowledge that there's this limitation in the data, um, but at the same time, I think it's still informative because um, number one, the, the data 
that I have here tend to cover the most important tax revenue for each of uh, one of those dynasties. And number two, because here I'm not really interested in total tax revenue. Instead, I'm interested in the spatial distribution of tax burden across the country. Uh, and the information that I gather here will be informative in showing that spatial distribution. Okay, that said, um, out of those three variables of state capacity, I'm going to use administrative centers as the main variable because it is most accurately measured and it is uh, it has the highest frequency because it is annual frequency. Whereas for the other two measurements, I'll, I'll treat them as more of a supplementary measurement. And then on the independent variable side, um, I have two variables that I use to measure the locality features. The first one is distance to foreign war hotspots. So I'm using this as a proxy for local demand of national defense. So the, a hotspot here uh, is defined as a location with more than three battles fought in any given century between a Chinese imperial government and a foreign power or between two or more fragmented Chinese states. Um, the definition here is slightly different from what has been used in the literature, uh, mostly because I also include the decentralized period in Chinese history. So, um, I mean, I'm defining a foreign war both uh, as both including those fought between Chinese government and foreign power, as well as those fought among fragmented states. Okay, and as you can see here from this um, plots, that the, the spatial distribution of foreign war hotspots is actually pretty, uh, you know, it's pretty evenly spaced out across China. Um, and for the main analysis, I'm going to focus on China proper, which is the central region um, that has been largely agricultural and that has been historically, um, you know, um, that has been historical hometown to the ethnic Chinese. And then for the second variable, I'm going to use the distance to the Yellow River as a proxy for local demand of hydraulic public goods. So most famously, we know that the Yellow River has changed its lower river course six times in the past 3,000 years. And it, is, it has affected a large region, which is about the size of England. So the Yellow River you know, is the famous river above ground. It has a large amount of um, mud and sediment carried in its water and frequently floods. So every time it floods, it imposes huge social economic as well as ecological pressure on the localities. So um, in this case, uh, I'm treating distance from the Yellow River uh, as a proxy for the local demand of hydraulic public goods. Uh, any questions here? Great. Uh, and of course, I, I uh, include a list of other variables, including you know, population density as a control of economic development. Um, I also have three measurements of local institutions, uh, which I'm going to come back later in the later half of the presentation. So here is the empirical model. So here, um, for the dependent variable, I have measurement of state capacity. For the independent variable, I have proximity to war and proximity to the Yellow River. So here, the proximity variables are basically negative logarithm form of distance to war and distance to the Yellow River. Uh, I'm taking the negative mostly because um, I want the coefficients to be easier to interpret. So this regression will be, um, it's a panel and it's at the grid cell century level. Um, for the main results, I'll focus on the China proper region that I mentioned earlier, uh, mostly because this region has a relatively uh, homogeneous economic conditions as well as demographic features. So the interpretation here will be easier. But as robustness checks, I'll extend the region to uh, either smaller region just to focus on the Yellow River um, 
Yellow River affected region, as well as bigger region of the contemporary China's boundary. And then here um, in this model, I'm going to interpret the two coefficients, beta 1 and beta 2, as being causal. Uh, well, and I understand that there might be concern for this causal claim. So for example, for beta 1, one concern is that the location of foreign war hotspots may not be entirely random. Uh, as we can imagine, some important cities is just a more, you know, more likely to be attacked. So in order to address this concern, uh, I'm going to restrict the sample to localities far away from the foreign war front line. So for example, I, want, uh, I will focus on localities that are more than 100 kilometers away from those hotspot cities. And the idea here is that, you know, presumably as, as you know, when we move farther away from the foreign world front lines, then the economic conditions of the, of the locality should not correlate with features of those hotspot cities. And then another concern for um, beta 2 is that, you know, Yellow River flooding and levee breakouts may not be entirely random. You know, this is understandably because uh, a lot of times the Yellow River floods because of bad local management. So here I'm going to address this concern by restricting the sample to localities gaining new access to the Yellow River. So the idea here is that, well, even though the flooding itself may not be random, um, given the large area that Yellow River might potentially affect, the exact location of its new river course is going to be relatively random. So, okay, can I can I ask yeah. a question here? This, sure. uh, uh, I'm no expert here, but uh, I, I wonder if it is okay to put you know the two proxies together because. Mm -hmm. Some um, variations in this uh, 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 distance to to Yellow uh, River might mm -hmm. be actually correlated with uh, variations in uh, uh, distance to to war uh, zones. For instance, I think you know in in Song Dynasty, mm -hmm. the reason why uh, uh, Yellow River changed its course is exactly because of uh, uh, military consideration. Mm -hmm. So so that's why I, I only know this uh, this event one single event. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as a robustness check, you just take that period out, but I don't know how many uh, mm -hmm. uh, other cases, you know, it's basically mm -hmm. caused by military consideration. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good point. Um, so I have two things to say. First of all, um, it is, you know, that event is pretty famous in the history of China, but it is actually not the norm. So I have data which uh, covers more than 1,000 times of Yellow River flooding. And out of all those um, you know, incidents, only five of them um, was um, you know, Yellow River levee breakout because of military considerations. But even though those events are rare, I understand that they have a prominent role um, um, because they just have been featured uh, importantly in the history. Um, so as a second point, um, in this data, those two prox proximity variables are not, not are actually not very highly correlated. Um, if you can, you know, take a look at this picture, uh, you can see that the location of war hotspots actually is very evenly spaced out across China. So it's not uh, it's not closely related to the location of the Yellow River. That's what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, um, but your concern is a is a very good one, and I think in, it does not complicate so much the proximity uh, variable, but it does complicate the timing because Yellow River tends to flood more often during instable times. So it could be because of military considerations, or it could just be that, you know, in the time of war, the central states have less. Um, capability to maintain the hydraulic projects along the river. So the river tends to flood more often. Um, in this paper, I'm gonna try to deal with that. Uh, first of all, by controlling for time and um, you know, location fixed effects. Uh, and uh, secondly, I'm gonna try to you know, restrict the sample to 
locations that are gaining new access. So supposedly, you know, those places that were that are gaining new access to the Yellow River are, um, you know, they should not be subject to this concern of bad management in the previous river course. Um, okay, uh, any more questions? Great. So um, here's the res uh, here's a very brief overview of the results. Um, as you can see here, um, throughout the different model specifications, we can see that proximity to war and proximity to Yellow River has consistent and positive impact on state capacity. Um, uh, of course, uh, I include a, a, a list of permutations, which due to the interest of time, I may not be able to show it here. But in the model, uh, I tried a few permutations of the basic model. Um, for example, I include dynamic model to allow for history dependence. I include provincial trend to allow for time varying regional heterogeneity, uh, and also spatial lack model to account for spatial correlations. And also to address you know, some concerns about endogeneity issues, I also restrict the sample to places that are far away from the foreign war front lines, and also restrict samples to regions that are uh, only gaining new access to the Yellow River. Um, uh, yeah. but to clarify, what do you mean? What do you mean by admin center? If this means the county state or prefecture state? Um, so the admin here is number of county and prefectural seats in the locality. So why would you want to set up a state uh, close to war spot? I don't understand the story. I thought you. Uh, you mean, why do I want to restrict to places far away from the war? No, uh, lo I'm lost about the whole hypothesis. I, I thought uh, mm -hmm. the intuition is you typically want to, I understand you want to emphasize public goods provision, but mm -hmm. there is a way to say such like the county state and the prefecture state. Mm -hmm. and naturally, you want to avoid the war spot because you want to know it's a, it's a, say, it's a center, like, you know, to govern the region, right? You don't want it to be close to war spot, no? I, I... Oh, you, you mean like, um, theoretically, why would the central state want to set up a county near the war? Is that your question? Yeah, especially the state, yes. I thought mm -hmm. you want to avoid that if you are natural, you are in the central government. How mm -hmm. is it very, isn't that very dangerous or risky to set to the other states? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think we have that kind of um, question, uh, mostly because we're, we're, we're looking at state development from a supply side. Um, so where we're thinking about the state, you know, is trying to optimize its revenue. And because, you know, places that are closer to war tends to have higher risk. So the state wants to avoid those high risk regions. Um, I think that um, is true if we will look at it from a supply side. But if we look at it from a demand side, uh, the, the a different dynamics is going on here because regions that are closer to the foreign war front lines, they have a greater need for national defense. They want the state to be there and to protect these people. But even that, uh, mm -hmm. I understand it, all this state was set by the central government. Is the the local? I, I'm lost about the total bargaining story, maybe. Is that could the local really play a very important role in deciding where to set to set to the state? Is there any historical mm -hmm. evidence? Um, you're right that the you know the the you know establishment of the the county seat is ultimately depend on the decision of the central government. Um, but at the same time, the local um, the locality, because they have greater demand for national defense, they might be able to give up a you know larger tax revenue. For example, they're willing to pay higher tax, and because you know they're paying higher tax, then it makes sense for the central government to be present in that locality. And this is indeed the case that I find in the data. So, for example, in Gansu area, 
right, the, the, along the Silk Road, it, it has not been uh, an agricultural productive region. Um, but it has very high level of state capacity if you look at locate, you know, location of a county seats. And at the same time, that region, uh, Gansu, Shanxi, they also pays a very high tax rate uh, at the per capita level. So I have data showing, you know, uh, for many different periods, the Middle West region, that Gansu, Shanxi, they pays higher tax rate than uh, the the southeast regions such as Zhejiang. So, so uh, I think you know the, the, the last column uh, makes sense, but the the first four columns, uh, mm -hmm. I, I really doubt you know. Uh, for let, let me give you uh, another mm -hmm. uh, 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 a story. That is, uh, uh, the front line has to be stopped uh, in a more densely populated area, or you mm -hmm. know in a more densely populated area. It's easier to mobilize uh, resources uh, uh, for defensive purposes. So, mm -hmm. so uh, unless you, you you show us, I think you know that's what the uh, Richard said that uh, uh, these variations are uh, driven by uh, establishment of new counties. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't think uh, I don't think this is actually an evidence for for your story. But mm -hmm. the, the last column I think makes sense. But then the concern is uh, if the data uh, is really. Uh, good there. I, I remember that you 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 said some uh, uh, issues about the data, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so let me speak to your first concern uh, first. Um, so first of all, the data on administrative centers here uh, includes establishment of new counties. Okay, it also includes um, upgrading of a county seats to prefectural level. So in other words, the central state is. Um, is doing two things at the same time. They're establishing more administrative units at the, you know, the boundaries. They also uh, tend to put those um, administrative units at a higher, uh, you know, higher level because of their political importance. Okay. Um, and another point I want to mention is that, well, um, even though we look at administrative centers, we think of them as you know the, the state want to be there or not, but they are also a lot of it is also driven by um, you know local economic conditions. If a place has you know pays a higher tax rate, and if a place um, you know is strategically important in terms of you know. Um, uh, trade, domestic trade and tax revenue generation, then the central states will establish uh, administrative centers there because, you know, once you have an administrative center, you have office to collect tax, you have office to, you know, judge on, um, uh, to, to judge on the local uh, lawsuits, and then you, you have the administrative capacity to do a lot of things. Uh, is it just mm -hmm. clarification? So the column mm -hmm. one to three. So, so are you saying that, that this uh, this effect is mainly driven by uh, uh, new counties or new you know uh, prefectures? Uh, yes. I see. So Richard, so how how do you think about that? So uh, I have no idea at all. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the establishment <laughs> of uh, counties. It, it could make a lot of sense because I think about uh, you know uh, many uh, confrontations uh, in the borderline it's true that uh, some uh, new uh, uh, cities will be will be built but you know I don't know how representative this phenomenon is it strikes me as uh, something uh, uh, very new to me yeah. Um, another thing I want to mention here is that um, it's not just about the front line so you know, even if I restrict the sample to places that are far away, the 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 phenomenon is still there. So a good way to think of it is to you know think of the North Song Dynasty versus South 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 Song Dynasty, right? Uh, during the Song, Song Dynasty, we have the center, we have the political center moving to the south, and along with that the central government established more administrative units in the south because now the south is you know providing more tax revenue and is more important um, and of course from you know uh, you, uh, from a national defense perspective because now the south is closer 
to foreign war front lines. So they, they have greater demands for national defense. If you compare the Song Dynasty to the Tang Dynasty, when during the Tang Dynasty, the country was big and most of the wars are fought so far away in Xinjiang and uh, Inner Mongolia. And during those times, the South region of China, they do not see the need for a state. And because of that, they're resisting this, um, the, the, uh, the advances of the central state. So um, in history, we have many examples of, you know, southern regions such as Zhejiang, they have been paying a historical tax rate and then, um, you know, they think that is unfair, so they restrict all those. And, and part of the reason is because they are paying the taxes, but they are not receiving, they, at least from their perspective, they are not receiving state services that, it, that is worthy of their tax contribution. So a suggestion is, uh, you know, if if the so one one concern is uh, mm-hmm. when you mentioned this uh, uh, Nan Song uh, mm-hmm. dynasty, uh, mm-hmm. it could be the case that it's just because uh, massive uh, migration from uh, north to 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 south. So mm-hmm. in response to this uh, migration, and a lot of new uh, counties or prefectures were established. Uh, mm-hmm. So one way to do that is just to control for this migration flow. I think uh, uh, some people have uh, have recorded, uh, uh, have uh, have collected data actually on that, mm-hmm. right? So if you can control for that, then say, well, uh, the establishment of the counties is not driven by, was not entirely driven by migration. It's uh, driven mm-hmm. by, you know, the, the mechanism in, in your paper, then I think it would be more convincing. That's just mm-hmm. a, a, a suggestion. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think um, Baiying has been collecting some of those uh, migration data. Maybe I can talk to him about that. Um, in this current version of the paper, I try to control for this mechanism by, you know, including population density here. Uh, I also tried a, um, a robustness check where uh, instead of using density of administrative centers, I use uh, administrative centers per capita. Uh, and the results there is pretty similar. So I'm relatively confident that this is not driven just by migration pattern. Okay. Um, sorry, I think I have a question from the chat box. Uh, if the flood of Yellow River means that local people demand more public goods, is the same story valid for other forms of natural disasters like earthquakes, drought, plague, and uh, locust invasion? Uh, well, um, theoretically, I think yes, um, but in this paper, I do not have enough empirical evidence to answer this question. So from a theoretical perspective, I think any kinds of natural disaster, which increases the value of local public goods, should increase um, the, the, the capacity of the state. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, I do not have enough empirical evidence to answer this question. Okay, great. So um, let me move forward. Um, so you know, here um, because of the uh, interest of the time, I won't have, I won't be able to dive into the details of those uh, results. Uh, let me just briefly summarize it here. So here, uh, basically, throughout the different permutations and robustness checks, uh, what I find is that national defense has a significant and positive impact on central state capacity. Uh, in comparison, the impact of the Yellow River, uh, even though it's mostly significant, but it tends to be smaller and it also tends to be more local. So in other words, if you are moving away from the Yellow River region, then this impact um, start to disappear. Okay. And then I also found that the impacts of both variables are stronger in the earlier stages. So in the, you know, when we move back further into history, then the variables tend to be more significant. Uh, this makes sense because we, you know, we, we tend to think that the value of public goods will be more important for stages in their early, uh, for states in the early stages of development rather than mature established states. Okay. So, then as an extension of the main results, I also um, want to examine the interaction of state with local institutions. So, you know, in the literature on state development, 
um, there has been this debate between representative government and elite politics. So for the literature of representative governments, uh, what they've been arguing is that if we, if we want to increase the capacity of a state, we need to tie the hands of the dictator. So only by tying the hands of the dictator, we will be able to make commitment of the central government credible. And only by achieving this credibility will the government be able to raise more tax revenue. And on the other hand, the literature of elite politics argue that local elite, they, they can simply serve as a substitute for central government in terms of public goods provision. So what, you know, at the center of this debate, it is in fact an empirical question as, you know, for state and local institutions, are they complementary, are they complementary or substitute? And then this also speaks to the broader literature of state society relations. So for example, in the new book by Asmogul and Robinson, they argue that liberty in short requires a strong state balanced by a strong society. So for example, warfare in early modern Europe pushed Prussia, but not Switzerland towards despotism because Switzerland society was able to counterbalance a more powerful state. Uh, and this is uh, exactly the argument that I wanna in, uh, investigate in this uh, empirical extension. So here I examine the interaction between local institutions and state capacities responses to public goods. So I have to mention this in the beginning um, because in this empirical setting, I'm treating local institutions as given. There could be some caveats to that point uh, and I will return to that later. And then here I have three measures of local institutions. The first one is based on uh, ethnic minorities. So the measurement I use here is percentage of administrative units in the locality that are being classified as ethnic minority regions. So this variable will hopefully measures the strength of uh, ethnic minority in this locality. And then the second variable uh, is based on local lineages. The variable I used here is a uh, number of ge genealogy books compiled in the locality. And hopefully this variable will help me measure the strength of lineages in the, in the, in the locality. And then the third variable I use is, uh, it, it can, it's based on religion. So here the variable is a number of Buddhist temples constructed uh, during a century in the locality. Okay. Sorry, are these yeah. all contemporary measures? Like ethnic minority, how do you know the historic ethnic minority in the past? And religion, like Buddhist, mm -hmm. probably they mostly built after Eastern Han, so after Buddhism spread to China, right? So how is mm -hmm. constructed? Um, right, so um, how are these data constructed? Well, I have a little bit details here about the original source for each one of these variables. Uh, and you're right that, um, you know, the, the, those variables, the time coverage may not be the same. So for example, religion, it tends to focus more uh, in the medieval period, you know, after the Eastern Han Dynasty all the way till the Song Dynasty. And the lineages, it tends to focus more on the later imperial period. So starting from after the Song Dynasty. Um, that's, you know, this time difference is actually one of the reasons that I decide to use three measures because I cannot get a consistent measurement of local institutions throughout the, the, the sample period. Um, and um, another reason that I choose uh, three measures of institution of local institutions uh, is because from an identification perspective um, my empirical setting here has the problem because the effect of local institutions it could be confounded by other unobserved social economic uh, characteristics such as local economic development so um, here i chose three variables of local institutions because uh, presumably they have they could have opposite relationship with economic development. So for example, religion 
uh, we might believe that, you know, it, it is uh, more likely to have Buddhist temples constructed in wealthier regions, uh, whereas ethnic minority, it, it is um, certainly, almost certainly that they tend to concentrate in less developed regions. So um, because they tend to have this opposite relationship with economic development, then my hope is that if I were able to get a consistent uh, result throughout all three variables of local institutions, then this might lend more credibility to my results. I see, thanks. Um, Richard, can I can I ask how much time do I have? Oh yeah, you have uh, uh, eight, uh, 10 minutes, or, or as long as ten minutes. Oh, sorry, uh, just thirteen minutes. Sorry, thirteen. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I, I did have some time to. Um, okay, great. So. Um, uh, here I uh, so here I first look at ethnic minorities uh, as and as you can see here in this um, in this table we have the interaction term between proximity to war and you know the strength of local ethnic minorities uh, we have the interaction between them um, being negative and significant so what this suggests uh, is that regions with more presence of ethnic minorities, they tend to have um, a smaller, you know, national defense tend to have smaller impact on state capacity. So this will fit the substitute story where, you know, local elites can serve sort of as uh, a substitute in terms of providing public goods. And then, um, for you know, uh, local institutions as measured by lineages, we have a very similar finding, uh, even though here the coefficient is less significant, uh, which makes sense because you know, lineages, even though they're, you know, they're, they can play a prominent role in resolving conflicts and enforcing contract and all that, uh, they may not be so effective in terms of providing national defense. Uh, and then we have the, you know, the results on religion, uh, again, it's uh, significant and it has a, a, a slightly larger magnitude compared to, to the to the other two variables. Okay. Um, so let me, maybe I can quickly wrap up the results and then we can have more time for discussion. Um, so here for all three measures of local institutions, uh, they appear to weaken the impact of foreign war on state capacity. And this suggests a substitute rather than complementary relationship between the state and local institutions. Um, and of course, one of the question here is that, can we treat local institutions as given? So um, in this empirical investigation, I'm, I'm adopting this assumption, um, mostly just follow the tradition of the literature, um, the literature on culture and social institutions, they tend to consider those factors to be highly persistent. Uh, so in other words, it's very hard to change. Um, but of course, when you, you know, when you have a very long um, time window, such as mine here, you might ask the question as, you know, to what extent can we treat those local institutions as given? Um, I don't, don't have a good answer to that question as yet, um, but I would be happy to, you know, dive into more discussions if, uh, you know, and if you is interested from the audience. And then here is just a brief recap of the main results of the paper. Um, so here, you know, I utilizes, uh, I hoped to achieve identification, uh, achieve causal identification by utilizing changes in foreign war front lines as well as changes in Yellow River courses as the source of exogenous shocks to local demands of public goods. Uh, and then I find both forms, both forms of public goods, whether it's national defense or hydraulic management, to have a positive and significant impact on the expansion of central state capacity into the localities. So this actually goes back to the theories that I mentioned in the very beginning. Uh, we have, you know, the hydraulic civilization hypothesis proposed by Witt Fogel, and we have the famous uh, claim about war proposed by Tilly. So uh, in, in this paper, I find that 
you know, actually we have uh, evidence for both forms of public goods to have an impact in the history of China. And then um, out of the two factors, I find that foreign war turns out to be the most important factor. So this may not be so much interest, uh, may not be so interesting to economists, but, um, you know, as I come from a, a school of international studies and we have a lot of uh, Asian studies, scholars and historians, um, so to them, this is actually a very important point because they have been debating about the origin of states in East Asia for a long time. And they have always been this tension between the hydraulic civilization versus war. So here in my finding, uh, it, it turns out that uh, foreign war actually is a more uh, robust and more significant factor. And then lastly, um, I, uh, in the results, I find that the impact of foreign war is smaller in localities with stronger local institutions. And this suggests a, a substitute rather than complementary relationship between the state and the local institutions. Okay. So with that, I'll conclude. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we will have a few minutes for more questions and discussions. So Ms. Yuan, so you conclude by saying that it's a debate between hydraulic and war, but you haven't, you only deal with like, uh, the change of year really, but have you tried anything like crop suitability, suitability right? So the Northern, area uh, for wheat where the south is for rice and for mm -hmm. rice cultivation you need more hydraulic uh, uh, projects which might require more uh, supports right so maybe you can react the shock you look at with like, the crop suitability index that mm -hmm. people use right um yeah i think that's a very good point um i haven't used that yet uh, mostly because i um, can't think of a clear way as, as to how to achieve identification for that one. Um, because when, you know, if, if, if I move away, if I move beyond the, the Yellow River, then um, uh, it just, to me, it's just hard to find exogenous shocks in uh, the hydraulic ecosystem of the localities. So, um, yeah, I'd be happy to hear your opinions on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was thinking about the spatial variations, um, but yeah, you're right. So probably the, you need to impact the spatial variation with an exogenous shock, but I haven't come up with a good, um, shock yet. I, I, I try to understand, you know, uh, what does it mean? I mean, establish of a new uh, administrative units. Uh, uh, so I, I can see uh, that's a, that's a, uh, that's an increase in local uh, state capacity. But does it directly address, you know, the much bigger question that you? Uh, you asked at the beginning and you know uh, uh, at the end of the presentation so mm -hmm. for instance uh, say um i guess uh, if you can show I, I understand it's a long shot but if you can show somehow the, the uh, new uh, uh counties um bring in um new resources or you know because of the uh, uh increasing local state capacity uh, it generates uh, some kind of uh, spillovers or whatever effects uh, 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 you, but I understand the data is, is very limited. So I'm just trying to understand if you can find anything else other than, you know, the establishment of, uh, you know, administrative units uh, uh, so that you can tell us that um, more economic implications out mm -hmm. of this. Um, sure. So in the paper, I try. Well, I also find um, pretty uh, significant uh, effects on road networks and taxation. Um, uh, you know, as part of the data collection effort, I also checked into other variables, such as you know uh, establishment of local markets, 
and then um, you know local offices for um, contract enforcement and market regulation. Um, the issue there is um, mostly the availability of data. So data on those um, variables, it tend to be less consistent when it moves from one period to another. Um, and then of course, I have the choice to just to focus on a shorter period, and then I'll be able to say more on the you know, economic implications of the state capacity. Um, that's one direction that I'm trying to move into, to check into the economic implications of this. But the, well, one thing that bothers me is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you think about that, that as a relocation of resources, just you know, previously without war, mm -hmm. you you can you can build roads uh, elsewhere, mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. with this war, then you you have to build more roads closer to to the front line, mm -hmm. and then it's it seems to me it's just a relocation of resources without clear, you know, uh, implications at the every level, but mm -hmm. if you 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 say. Well, in the in the peaceful period, this is uh, this is uh, uh, the total amount of new roads built, and in this war period, especially in in, uh, in the in the in the neighborhood of uh, front lines, so you see a lot more uh, uh, roads and uh, built, and uh, the the uh, the regime would like to uh, uh, increase a lot their investment mm -hmm. uh, uh, roads, and therefore you know uh, you see uh, the much better infrastructure. Not just at uh, the war zone, but also, you know, uh, and even at the agri level, you see just a lot of investment on on road. Then, then that could be a kind of spillover. It could be long lasting effect. Mm -hmm. So, I guess uh, uh, my question is: uh, when you see the the, the road network, mm -hmm. so do you have an, any evidence uh, saying that uh, it's not just a relocation of the resources from one place to another? It, it affects. Uh, it can actually incentivizes uh, incentivizes uh, uh, the regime to invest a lot more, so that you know uh, previously they just consume it, they just eat it, and and now you know they would like to uh, save and invest because mm -hmm. of uh, because of the uh, conflicts mm -hmm. that will have a long lasting effect. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like the direction that you're pointing to. So you're basically saying you know instead of having a a uh, simple relocation problem, can I say anything about aggregate social welfare? Um, right. um, unfortunately, um, I don't think the current empirical setting will enable me to say that. Um, but uh, I see your point, and I, uh, that's actually one of the direction that I'm trying to move into. Uh, even though my my idea there is slightly different from the the you know the approach that you uh, mentioned, so um, the 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 thing that I'm trying to get is less about um, you know whether the state invests more into as a whole because for that I really cannot say the state is always budget constrained so I cannot say about um, whether the state makes a greater effort at management or not. But what I can say is that when the state establish uh, capacity in the locality, it tends to cater to the specific needs of the locality. So for example, the Song Dynasty, when they established more uh, county seats in the South, they actually set up more market. Uh, you know, market towns. They have more offices that are specifically um, designed for, you know, regulating the market or, you know, resolving contracts, um, uh, conflicts. Those agencies uh, were almost non-exist in the pre-Song period. And one, um, one potential hypothesis we can investigate there is that you know, when the state relocate its state capacity from one place to another, does it changes the function that the state, you know, prioritize? And if that's the case, then I think we will be able to make a more uh, aggregate level welfare uh, argument. Um, but that's the hope. Um, uh, yeah, I guess. Hi, Claire. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your great presentation. Thank you. Happy on a great 
uh, to his question. So my biggest concern is about the uh, interpretation about the correlation between proximity to war and uh, the administration seat. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and it made me think about the Charles Taylor's argument that war made, war made state and state made war. So it could be a reverse of uh, causality that the, the, the states establish the, uh, the direct rule. So they establish the country state and that make the states uh, more likely to collect the more tax and uh, so they can feed fit better a uh, large army so they can initiate uh, on the foreign power. So that would be a reverse of, of co correlation here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's a very valid concern. Um, so I try to rule out that uh, channel by doing two things. Uh, number one, I exclude any kind of domestic conflicts. So I only focus on foreign wars. So wars between a central government, central Chinese government and the foreign government or foreign power, foreign group, uh, which, and then number two, I also impose a pretty strong definition on what account as a foreign power. So the foreign power has to be in place for more than 50 years. So it cannot be just, you know, a, a short lived, um, power base that originates from domestic conflicts or peasant riots, uh, those groups are not counted at foreign. So the, the reason that I, that I impose this definition is because I, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I don't want, um, you know, my definition of foreign war to be plagued by the possibility that it is related to domestic conflicts. And then we get this, you know, uh, reverse causality that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. Okay, I'll just clarify the I'm slow now, maybe it's a bit late here. So you, you divided China proper into 3,000 or even more grades, right? Wouldn't that mean each grade only have at most one, one, one thousand grade? kilometer, uh, one, one thousand square kilometer? Yes, they do have at most one uh, county state in each period, I, I imagine. So, why would you use log as meeting center as outcome? It doesn't, uh, it's a bit strange. Oh. Uh, oh, uh, you mean why do I take a log form of the y variables? Yeah, because your Y as uh, a county seat it would be either most of the cases would be one or zero. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, a bit strange. You you take log over zero one. Do you see what I mean? Oh right. Um. So I'm taking log form because uh, the distribution is highly skewed. But so there. Not, it's just zero or one. It's not skewed at all. Um, it is actually very skewed because, you know, in the, as you mentioned, the Shanghai um, area tends to have a lot of county seats, which are very small. Um, so oh. I take logarithm form mostly to address that. Um, but as robustness check, I also examine uh, grid cells of bigger sizes. So the grid cell that I currently use is only 1,000 square kilometers. So as you mentioned, it's you know, roughly like the size of a county seat. Um, but I also use bigger grid cells. Okay, I was just curious because, yeah. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I get the question from others as well. They, they mentioned, you know, why do you have this particular size? And how could you know grid cell attacks? I also don't get to that. Uh, could you say that again, please? Sorry, I didn't get it. I, I, at the time running out, I also don't get to the, how could you know grid level tax data? which is not exact, which doesn't exist. Uh -huh. Oh, right. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I uh, forgot to mention that in the, in the presentation that uh, when I have, for example, taxation data, which are at the county level, uh, I basically disaggregate it to the grid level um, by having a area weighted average. So, for example, if this grid just reside in one county and nothing else, then I'll have the tax per capita of that county assigned to this grid cell. Yeah, I guess that's another assumption. 